we are going to learn together, and I'll uh, ask the uh, neurologist in the room to help me out as we proceed talking about multiple sclerosis. Uh, first and foremost, um, there's a huge team. Uh, these are five of the characters that help, and Dr. Roberts and Sindhu and Maria and um, our MS neurologists are really the engine behind all this. And uh, I really see myself more or less as a, as a technician to just guide the patients through a little piece of their spectrum of care. And it's really nice to have a great team. Um, I've learned a lot about MS. I've learned a lot, um, not only preparing this, but taking care of these patients. And this is a question that came up, and I'll have you ponder this for the next 20 minutes. Um, what is the connection of those of us in this room with uh, these pictures? And uh, there'll be a cookie for whoever answers that question correctly at the end of the talk. So what is MS? Um, we know that it's a neurodegenerative disorder. We know that uh, we, we lose myelin, and uh, as you can see in this little video, the signal just doesn't move as fast. Um, it's a highly variable disease. Um, what neurosurgeons usually know of MS is they look at the funny MRI and they said, we're not biopsying that. If you biopsy it on the boards, you don't get board certified. So um, that's about the extent of our relationship with MS. And, um, and we know that pathologically, it represents multiple lesions in many areas of the CNS. Um, it's a big problem. Um, over a million people worldwide have MS. We know that women are affected more than men. Uh, it's younger patients, and uh, its prevalence in the U.S. is pretty bad. And then there's the whole north-south thing that I still don't really understand. I don't know if anybody understands it, if they would explain it to me at lunch. But the farther away you're from the equator, the higher your risk. And, uh, and again, no one's given me a good answer for this. Uh, but uh, Pete goes down to the equator frequently, and I think this is why. So he's trying to escape his MS risk. Um, again, it's an autoimmune disease. Our bodies cause this problem, and so once it happens, it's sort of all over. Um, people have figured out the B cell, T cell link and how it gets through the blood-brain barrier, and uh, these cells sort of attack the myelin sheaths, and then we just can't get the signals across. This point comes back later in that it's a clinically diagnosed disease. It's not um, like a brain tumor you see on an MRI. It's a, it's a syndrome. And even today, with MRI findings and, and tests, it's still clinical criteria and has been since the criteria were described a half century ago. Uh, we're a little better at it now, but it's still a clinical syndrome, so it's a little fuzzy to begin with, so the treatment of it becomes a little fuzzy. The other piece is that uh, MRI can change and the patient can stay exactly the same. So they would not be clinically different, but you'll see this dramatic, uh, this case over a course of a year, uh, a big difference. And so you know there's lesions happening all over the brain. And then going back to the point some of our colleagues made earlier, what are we really treating with DBS? We're creating more lesions. So if the circuits are broken in a way we don't know and we're breaking other circuits, we're not quite gonna get reproducible results series of treatments, a whole bunch of science that I don't understand. Um, and this is the stuff I really love. So um, back in the 1830s, the European literature started smatterings of stuff that smelled like MS. Uh, and then uh, this guy whose name I can't pronounce uh, really figured it out in 1850. Um, Charcot really sort of nailed the diagnosis. Uh, we developed lab tests in the 1940s. And then uh, MRI sort of took over. This parallels the history of how we wound up sticking wires into people's brains um, with uh, uh, Aldini, who a long time ago figured out it would be fun to stick electricity through people. The people he was doing this to were not alive, but it scared the community enough to put him in jail. And, uh, but he really was the first guy doing DBS, or superficial. <laughs> And then a lot of our colleagues, uh, a couple of hundred years later, started doing this in the early 1920s. Um, and then Cooper accidentally uh, cut the choroidal, created a lesion, got rid of tremor. And shortly thereafter, within a decade or two, we really figured out uh, stereotaxy and lesioning for treatment of disease. And that's been sort of what we've been after. The history of Thalamic surgery and lesioning for MS started in 1960 with Cooper and then uh, Broger and Fogg 
really sort of did the first uh, thalamotomy, and then Yasser did the stereotactic work, and by the 70s, it was scattering the literature, and a lot of centers were doing it. Funny enough, Cooper's review made no mention of a decade-old study by Yastergill, so I figured at that point they weren't getting along. So you can le learn a lot about neurosurgical politics by reading the literature. Um, the results were good, and then this is what makes me sort of excited about uh, writer's work, is that lesioning actually was pretty darn good and is pretty darn good for treating this disease. It's the only reason we went away from it was the complication risk. And hopefully with, with the new technologies of focused ultrasound, we'll be able to get, gain some of what we lost when we switched from lesioning to DBS. Um, DBS for MS tremor specifically uh, really hit the literature in 1980 with Bryce and his team. Benavid had only four of his patients in his initial uh, trial. And then the first prospective trial uh, was 15 patients that Hooper uh, published. And then there's been a smattering that's been reviewed, but there really hasn't been a quantum leap forward in treatment. Uh, and the question is why. Um, it's a creature we don't really understand. And, uh, and, and so I sort of see treating tremor as this monster in there, and we're only seeing a tiny little bit of it, and it's going to sort of pop up, especially in MS, and get us. <laughs> Did you guys know there's been five tremor movies? Five. How do they do that? Um, and then we're, you know, struggling about changing a $10,000 battery in millions of dollars. Um, but variable clinical features and variable electrophysiological features of tremor. So the tremor source is different. It is not pure cerebellar. It is not pure intention. And that's the problem that makes the efficacy of treating MS-based tremor a challenge. Um, and the questions are still to be answered. In the list of different kinds of tremors, there's two buckets that really fall out and, and cross over. It's Holmes tremor, which is a 3 to 4 hertz tremor. It's irregular, uppers more than lower. Uh, there's some intention and action tremor. There's postural tremor involved. Uh, and there's some uh, authorities that say this is ex exquisite and distinct from multiple sclerosis-related tremor. And then there's others who think it's the same thing. So depending on who you read and who you talk to, um, and I'd love the opinion of any who, who deal with this, of which way it falls and if, if we can categorize these the same, uh, because I think the treatment isn't very different, at least from the standpoint of uh, stimulation. But uh, with MS, we also know there's, there's substantial uh, cerebellar origin because some of the clinical studies indicate that. Targets for treating tremor, um, VIM still remains the number one. It's got the best track record in history from PD and ET, and so we sort of default to it. Uh, the older targets for the uh, lesioning um, haven't really been revived yet, but the dual target therapy that's come in uh, the last five to seven years in the literature is showing some promise. Um, and the PSA, again, has more recently in the last two or three years shown up in the literature as possible targets. But no one's really shown much more than a few patients at a time in, in these series. Um, if you look back, uh, look at the results column uh, in, uh, in here, and I'm pointing to my screen and not yours, uh, the results were pretty good. So um, we know that the lesioning was effective. We had, unfortunately, with lesioning about in the early trials, a, a lot of complications. And then when we look at uh, DBS for the same, um, the early results were pretty good, but again, the numbers are very small. And uh, when we go out into longer-term follow-up, the results sort of drop off in the literature. So the question is, why? Why are we getting such good effect early on, and then um, later on we're not? Could it be just simple disease progression? You're knocking out other fibers. You're knocking out other centers, creating other lesions. Um, or are you actually losing the efficacy of the lesion effect of stimulation in that particular patient population? Um, Dr. Roberts did a great job of reviewing our small series of patients. And uh, as you can see, we, we had decent effect overall, which matched what we found in the literature. Um, a couple of patients, um, no effect at all, just no, no change in their tremor rating, and uh, some pretty profound. Um, our oldest patient in our series has had it for nine years now, um, or eight years, with uh, pretty sustained effect. So I know in some cases it works. 
I cannot distinguish those patients from the patients who have failed. Our worst failure, however, was a patient who, if you read the early literature, we should have avoided because she came in in a wheelchair. And young lady, actress, um, very engaged in life, engaged family, um, seemed like an ideal candidate, but uh, rapidly over the 12 to 18 months after our implantation, um, she lost function for other reasons uh, but, and had no yield. So we went through uh, an inordinate amount of work to put a DBS in a patient who did not get used for it and had it turned off within a couple of months. So those are the situations I feel bad about, and I think that that really is one of our worst complications to put a patient through that and then gain nothing. Um, so we have to get better at figuring that out. Um, and so in summary, it's a useful therapy. Um, I think it should be considered in MS patients who have stable disease, refractory tremor, and can otherwise tolerate um, the stimulation. Um, the patient selection is really the, the, the bit that we have to focus on. It can't be severely debilitated, and they can't have episodes of relapsing disease that's going to override what benefit we gain. Um, the expectations of the patients and the family have to be realistic, as always. It, this isn't going to fix anything else in MS other than um, the tremor and then certain types of tremor only. Um, and we as a community need to really sort of pool our resources because this is a rare uh, population and see if we can better distinguish um, it's over 100,000 DBS implanted. There's maybe uh, 100 to 200 cases in the literature of MS uh, treated with DBS. Um, I'm sure in this room we could probably put together 50 to 100 patients uh, that we've treated with MS. Who's done MS for DBS for MS? So, so we have the power to sort of put our heads and our data together to come up with some better answers quickly. Um, so that would be one, one plug to you guys is if, uh, if we can come up with ideas to do that, I think we could really advance the care of these patients. Um, if anyone come up with an answer? Anyone know where this is? Continent? <laughs> there you go. So, uh, so, so uh, this is Scheidam, uh, a city in southern Holland, which, where I have not been, but now I want to go. And uh, uh, in 1394, Ledwina well, was a 15-year-old ice skating and fell, and uh, uh, later became the patron saint of ice skating. I didn't know you could do that. Um, end of suffering, because she kept getting sick over and over again, uh, but gained great fame in her local city. Uh, but that's the first suspected case of multiple sclerosis in the uh, in the Western literature. Like Tanya Harding. <laughs> <laughs> there may be a genetic linkage to ice skaters. Um, anyway, well, thank you very much.